Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation. What do IT and engineering leaders need to know about observability? Brought to you by Observe. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters, Jacob Leverich and James Governor. Jacob Leverich is co-founder and VP of engineering of Observe. An admitted adrenaline junkie, his passion for observability was sparked by formative years carrying a pager and fighting IT fires. James Governor is co-founder of Redmonk, the only developer-focused industry analyst firm. Based in London, he advises clients on practitioner-led technology adoption and engineering, open source, community, and technology strategy. He came up with the term progressive delivery and the phrase motivating in a surreal kind of way. He's a known vermouth advocate. And with that, I will pass it off to our presenters. Hi, uh, I'm James Governor, co-founder of Redmonk. Uh, I'm uh, here for another conversation with Redmonk, a Redmonk conversation. I'm here with Jacob Leverich, a co-founder and the VP of engineering at Observe. And we're here to talk about observability, what we're seeing in and around SRE and IT and engineering leaders, what's going on in the space. So over to you, uh, Jacob, a couple of things. First, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, how you got here and a bit about your role? Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so my name's uh, Jacob, uh, you know, one of the co-founders of Observe, so kind of been with Observe since the beginning. We've been going for about four years now. And uh, my day job is, is VP of engineering. So, you know, trying to keep the train on the tracks, get our product out the door, uh, put out all the fires, all the kind of regular stuff you'd expect. Um, so very, very tactical these days. Um, but um, okay. kind of, you know, got, got to help in the ideation and sort of getting us all off the ground. Um, and luckily, I'm sure you can find those fires because you're observed, right? Oh, yeah. The, I, I could talk hours about that. Yeah. So we, we are our biggest user. You know, we dog food. Uh, Observe like crazy. We have an environment we call O2, which is observe on observe. And it's, it's sort of one of our, our, our main tools for, for figuring stuff out and, and what's going on with us. But um, uh, but anyway, so awesome. Um, so you're, you're, you're using your own tools mm -hmm. uh, to, to keep the, the, the trains on the track. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think I made a Snowpiercer joke the other day. And definitely there are people that have seen Snowpiercer. You know, we're here in this troubling environment. We've got to keep the train uh, yeah. running on the track. Um, yeah. From that perspective, and I guess this is one of the questions for Red Monk, one of the questions for Observe, one of the questions for the industry, and that's kind of like, what is observability? Because um, obviously there's there's some noise in the market. Um, there is some observability washing. Uh, you know, we've got the questions of is it is it three pillars? So to you, um, Jacob, what what how do you define observability? Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of kind of throwaway answers to this. Let's start with those, right? So like one of the throwaway answers is like, uh, you know, like going back to like control theory, you know, observability is, is it the ability to infer the internal state of a system based on its external outputs, you know? And so that's, that's a nice philosophical approach to this. You know, we're running these complex <laughs> digital systems. They're admitting like all this sort of like, you know, logs, metrics, traces, all this sort of data and, and trying to infer what's going on inside based on what we see from the outside. You know, it's kind of a nice thought. Um, but it's it's kind of it's not totally actionable in and of itself as, as like a definition. Like, what do I what do I do with that definition? Um, yeah, anytime I, you hear infer, you're yeah, like, wait, yeah. how, <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, like okay, but uh, yeah. I've got problems to solve. Inferring does indeed sound a bit philosophical. Yeah, totally. Um, and so so that, that's I guess that's that's one that's one part that's one I guess throwaway definition. Another throwaway is. Uh, yeah, which you just mentioned, like logs, metrics, traces, the three pillars sort of concept here is like in order to like achieve mm -hmm. observability, you know, it, it's it's a matter of assembling, you know, logs, metrics, traces, getting all these different sorts of or getting solutions in place um, for each one of, of these types of, of data. And, and, and frankly, I, I kind of find that definition uh, a, a little bit unsatisfying like on its own, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, yeah. uh, I, I hate to break the news, but if you just like, you know, if you get an elk cluster for, for your logs and, and a Prometheus instance for your metrics and a Jaeger, you know, deployment for your traces, you don't quite have observability yet. You know, you have like a, you know, a bag of rocks and you got to figure out like actually what to do with it. You know, like, yep. you know, when you actually have an alert coming out of Prometheus, what was the error? You know, like, how do you actually like diagnose it without like diving through this stuff? And and sort of navigating through this data, you know, is in my mind okay. kind of one of the one of the keys. Navigation, yeah, yeah I think that yeah. that's right. I mean, so for me, I, I, you know, there's a couple of ways of looking at it, and and one is is it almost it's the jobs the job to be done. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not so much about the you know the pillars of the technology, but it's about 
it, we're increasingly in a world where it is about troubleshooting. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly closer to an environment. Look, and I'm not going to say that everything is 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 testing in production, but we're yeah. we're certainly you know we are going to have to fix systems that break in production. And um, you know, we live in a world if if you know if if it's it, it you know it 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 might be an SRE that's directly on the team. It might be the developer themselves, that notion of responsibility, but basically the job to be done is being able to identify, troubleshoot systems and fix problems. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, and it can't be in the sense of a, a, a dashboard, like where we know what might go, oh, look, yay, it's this memory problem again. We've had this problem before. We got, you know, we've, we, you know, it, it's got to be something where we can genuinely go in and understand the behavior of the system. So one is a sort of job to be done, and and that is much more about about troubleshooting uh, the system, and th and then the other one is about what you must. So uh, my 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 colleague Stephen wrote a great piece, the developer experience gap. In order to have that deal with that job to be done, where there is a lot of information, it might be you know high cardinality. In order to be able to do this, we've got you know how do we deal with the developer experience gap? Mm -hmm. And I guess from my perspective. You know, we go through that into a, a an observability experience gap. You need something that is going to help you navigate and uh, uh, identify issues. Now, sometimes you might want to use the system, you know, it, you, in order to do good troubleshooting, sometimes you're just using it to understand the state as it is. But yeah, I think it's two of those. Job to be done. And this is... yeah. This is definitely a long answer, but job to be done and the ex the the, ex the experience platform that pulls yeah. this stuff together so that you can do that job. Yeah, no, I actually, I love I love the way you described it because that's that's that is very much in line with the way that, that I, I personally think about it. Say so it's like you know achieving observability is largely about consolidating like a few the different like kind of workflows and sort of use cases that that one has in SRE and DevOps and, and even engineering. Uh, so it's like there's monitoring, troubleshooting, and analytics. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like kind of the three pillars, like sort of speak to like different parts of those different workflows, but like observability is more about having like a practice and a competency that allows you to sort of transition from like one of those use cases to another. And so, yeah, so like, you know, sure you have an alerting system, you have a bunch of metrics, you have a bunch of dashboards that helps you with the monitoring, but like, like making sure that you can elegantly trans like, uh, I guess, uh, uh, tran uh translate, uh, and that's not what I want, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, move into the troubleshooting workflow from an mm -hmm. alert is sort of like one of the core competencies and sort of like, how do you make that handoff, you know, and, and sort of, is that, you know, a cross team handoff or is that something you do kind of internally? Um, mm -hmm. you, know, when you think about like a DevOps practice, you know, we're trying to, to stop throwing things over the wall and sort of have more shared responsibility for these different yes. use cases. And so that sort of means like, Hey, you know, when an alert is fired, you know, that's, that's not just. I need to inform someone to do something about it. It's like, no, it's also my responsibility to troubleshoot it. So I really like that notion of a competence because now that enough of us have a competence, we've, we've been through, um, you know, clearly, uh, historically, we, you know, sysadmin roles, uh, separate from developer roles. Uh, we began to hopefully, you know, uh, get a bit, get, get a bit better. We, we sort of talked about, you know, DevOps in some cases that was just a, you know, global search and replace on your LinkedIn profile. You know, then went into like SRE, but tell me a bit about competence and what are you seeing in your customers and how do you expect that to be evolving mm -hmm. in terms of, mm -hmm. of organizations that are really ready to understand observability and the sort of the, the, the this focus on, on production and, and troubleshooting. So yeah, like what are you, yeah. what are you, what are you seeing in terms of the, what's the competence, what's the muscle that we are building? Um, and, and, and how can we do more of that? And then how could a tool help support that culture change? Oh, totally. Yeah. There's sort of, I think it's something I've, I've seen quite a few times now, and even in my own personal journey, which I can talk about a little bit later, but, uh, but there's sort of a maturation journey that everyone seems to mm -hmm. kind of go through here. Um, and, and, and what it boils down to is, is when you start out implementing some new system, new service, new system, new technology or whatever, um, you know, monitoring and, and troubleshooting isn't necessarily like your number one priority. You know, your number mm -hmm. one priority is to make a great product and solve a customer's problem, you know, and that's sort of like yep. where you focus like a lot of your effort in the early months, you know. 
And, and when you start to, to deploy whatever it is your solution, you know, whether it's an online service or you're shipping software to people, whatever it is, you know, you, you start to, I, I guess, you, know, you start to encounter your first few issues in the wild and you have to learn how to troubleshoot them. And, and a lot of times you're just using whatever data is in place already. You know, back back in the day, this this was like SSHing into the web server, running top, right. you know, looking at the airlocks, like trying to figure it out just from like what what you know, like kind of raw data is available there, and and that works for a moment. That works with a small team where like you know, you, hey, you have one guy on the team who's like your your ops specialist and like he can kind of do all that stuff and he's a hero and like that that mm -hmm. that works at that that early stage. Um, but then you know, as you as you grow. Um, as as kind of more stakeholders become involved and as you kind of like split into multiple engineering teams or there's like kind of there's, you know, a sales team involved that also wants to have answers to questions, all sorts of stuff starts to happen. Yeah. Um, you, you know, kind of this solution of SSHing into the server is kind of no longer scalable. And so you yeah. start to start to centralize, you know, a lot of the telemetry. You start to try to build like kind of like trusted repositories of all this data. And kind of one view that people can get at, and you can kind of have credentials there, so you don't need credentials everywhere, and, and sort of you know that's kind of that next stage of, of maturation. And then I, I think the interesting thing that that you know folks tend to go through is is once they start to consolidate this data into a central place, um, you know they they start having to think about like well what, what is what is well, how can I instrument my environment or my application to make it easy to consolidate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start learning little tricks like, hey, if I label these metrics consistently or I sort of, you know, have these common fields in my logs, I can start to build interesting dashboards that start giving reports like on, you know, users or customers or, or different services. And, and you start to, to learn how to like consistently instrument your applications. Um, and so... And so it just sort of, it changes the, the way you think about your, your obligations when you're writing software. Yeah, no, yeah. I love, I mean, I, I sometimes talk about, you know, good instrumentation. Yeah. It's like a, a love letter to your, your future self or indeed perhaps others, because, you know, something's going to break and, you know, um, that, that thinking about what the log should look like and how I should instrument the system for observability, that's part of the, the competence change, the culture change really thinking about, hang on a second, can I provide better information about the system as it's supposed to perform in order that when it is not performing in that way, people, so just trying to understand the ways in which it might break, um, being able to, uh, as you say, instrument it, instrument it accordingly. So I guess that's definitely part of the, the competence yeah. is being a lot more proactive about uh, as I say about those logs, thinking about what it's going to look like when you've identified a trace and what you're going to be correlating with what. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's that really tr triggers me in thinking about the competence and the competence change. Yeah, is a sense of responsibility and writing that that love letter so that because you know, bottom line, nobody wants to get up in the middle of the night, and if you do, then you you know because some of us have to do that then. You want to get to bed as quickly as possible, right? Right. So, yeah, the, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, that that really resonates. Well, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I'm I'm also thinking back to like my, my personal journey on, on this one. Like, I, I was definitely uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to start from the beginning. Um, uh, so, I I kind of started my career late '90s, early 2000s as the Linux admin, and and mm -hmm. I was definitely like the the kid that was like doing this all from scratch. Uh, just sort of like homegrown, you know, cron jobs and like mountains of Perl scripts to monitor and maintain, you know, <laughs> fleets of servers, uh, and 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 that was that was fun. Like I I do remember like just the thrill of like kind of like you know troubleshooting of like putting all this instrumentation in, in place, you know, yeah, the answering pages and and, and getting up in the middle of the night and fixing stuff. That that was all fun. Um, but but later on in my career, um, so I ended up as an engineer at Splunk, and so I worked mm -hmm. on the, the core search engine. At Splunk and, and got to see kind of what one of these these enterprise sort of solutions looked like uh, from the inside, and, and and it really like kind of as I got deeper and deeper into 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 Splunk and sort of the what it did, um, I I began to realize like holy crap if I had had this when I was a practitioner I would have been way better at my job, mm -hmm. and and it's sort of it's you know it's it's maybe in some cases a little bit more boring to like use like the vendor tool to like solve this problem but like at the end For of the sure. day. 
like like you know my job is to build a system that is maintainable and is monitorable and i can troubleshoot and to and to be able to to share that capacity with other people and and sort of uh it, it, it kind of took a while it took like a decade for me to like really like kind of go through that journey and to understand the value mm -hmm. Uh, of of having good standards and practices and good so let's tooling. talk a bit about yeah. that balance between build versus buy mm. and why in your mind and you know heaven forbid that you, you know you 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 know you were like observe is the tool because yeah but like yeah. what you know what are you seeing because there is a lot of homegrown observability out there and there's also there's like an expectation like oh well you know cloud native stack so we know we're going to have like some well there, there are like a couple of answers one is I do Kubernetes, so of course I'm going to use Prometheus and Grafana and yeah. Hotel, and I'm going to have all of this data, and it's going to be awesome. Or you might be like, "Well, I'm the Elastic person, so I'm going to build this like Elk stack thing, and I'm going to have all like." What do you like when you look at those systems? And for me, part of the caution there is they require a lot of care and feeding and attention. Yeah. What what? why should an organization that is, you know, when you engage with customers as well, why should a company that is, has, has looked at those is building their own, why should they be like, wait, hang on a second, let's outsource some of the management, some of the complexity to a third party. In this case, you know, I, I, I would expect that you would, you would say, you know, you should, you know, observe can help you out here. What's the, what's the advantage of that, that package solution that you're offering? Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, that, I, I, I'd love for the answer to, to be observed, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question a little bit around about way. I think I'm gonna try to break this into into three different parts. It's, just, it's a lot okay. to, to build versus buy. Um, so I think just generally, like build versus buy decisions, like it's done, this isn't just about like your your observability stack. Like this is generally like kind of a question you have to answer. Uh, time and time again, as you're across the board, out. data management's a huge one. Yeah, Everyone yeah. right now is like, why am I managing my own databases? <laughs> yeah. We live in an era of cloud, and here I am. You know, Hadoop had that. It's like, oh, I've got this yeah. massive on-prem Hadoop cluster, and yeah. you know, it's like, why do I have this? So yeah, uh, you and, know, and, and, data and, management. You know, we're seeing it across the board. Yeah, uh, databases of all kinds. So, so yeah, exactly. no, it's definitely not just an observability question. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, the most boring I can think of is like, Hey, like your, your, your relational database, like your Postgres instance, you know, like you have like three choices. Like you could, you could roll your own, which uh, mm -hmm. don't do that. That's very hard. <laughs> uh, you can, you can run, you know, Postgres in house and, and that's, that's plausible. I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons, pros and cons, you know, about doing that, or, mm -hmm. or you can use a hosted, you know, you know, cloud SQL thing like Aurora. And kind of mm -hmm. you know get some of the a lot of the manageability sort of benefits of using a cloud hosting sure. provider and 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 really it just boils down to like hey how much time and effort are you willing to invest in this and and like how key is it to like your success you know like are are you going to innovate on a SQL database in order to to deliver your application or is it just sort of a means to right. the end and sort of like how how much of an investment is it worth. Um, and so, so just is generally that that framework of thinking about these things, and, and for what it's worth, um, uh, you know, we at Observe kind of went through a lot of that sort of thought process as well. Um, and so, there's, there's basically uh, one of the things to know about Observe is that we've built our solution on top of Snowflake. Uh, so we built our solution like kind of using Snowflake, this is cloud data warehouse as the data store mm -hmm. of record. Uh, which is a, a slightly unusual decision for the space. You know, a lot of a lot of vendors uh, tend to uh, try to hyper specialize on some dimension. Absolutely, the, yeah. the data management is their bread and butter. That's their differentiator. So, yeah, you know, they can't they can't build on someone else. Yeah, yeah. And so, so thinking about like, well, like, hey, what are the requirements we we, we need out of out of our data management platform? Um, is sort of what, what are the, the real essence of like this use case? And, and there's, there's a few different pieces, but you know, one of them is that like you're dealing with massive volumes of data, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so kind of like, a, a, I would say a, a, a normal use case is like, you know, is, you know, uh, several terabytes of data per day, you know, for like one, you know, user, um, you know, that was, you know, uh, uh, that's, you know, that's tens of megabytes a second per data, you know, kind of, and, and that's, that's not just. That's, that's for each customer, right? And we expect to have hundreds or thousands of customers. So like the volume of data that we're dealing with is like very, very massive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second is that it needs to be, uh, it needs to be cost-effective, right? It needs to be like kind of, you know, like reasonable to like store this data 
for months or, or, or a year or, or multiple years at a time. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. the, the use cases that people have, you know, for all of this, this data they collect from the systems, you know, sometimes it's compliance related and you need 13 months of, of data to. No, uh, no doubt. I do yeah. think that, I mean, from my perspective and, you know, I don't need to tell you a story for you, but, but certainly, yeah. you know, having spoken to Jeremy Button, you know, uh, great storyteller, but one of the points he made about the advantages of the snowflake architecture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is the fact that they are built on S3. And so in terms of the, 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 the great unwashed data that you might be storing for a long time and everything else, you could take advantage of S3's economics. You're not doing everything at the level of the data warehouse in effect. And, and, and you know, in the way that we would normally understand it. And I thought that was interesting yeah. because yeah. for me, observability often had seemed like um, it is a scale problem. And, and like, how can I economically store all of this data, choose which pieces I'm going to analyze? And then how does that tie into the like, wait, what, what if my problem actually is a historical problem with compliance regulations? So I, I think for me, that was really interesting. Like, when did that become really obvious to you? Was it, oh, <laughs> if we build on Snowflake, it will be that economically viable mm. in a way that we might not have expected? Or was it a... It, they're a powerful solution, and then you kind of realized, oh, actually, that really defines the economics as well. Yeah, uh, it's it's. Well, I, I have to say that I think that we saw the writing on the wall for this one quite a long time ago, um, and, and and there's there's a lot of different places you can pick this up. But uh, just just personally, so I spent a little bit of time at, at Google. I worked I worked on a MapReduce team and did some performance uh, sort of uh, engineering uh, uh, while I was there, mm -hmm. and. Um, and kind of while I was there, I got, got to peek at like a lot of the cool stuff going on under the covers there. And, um, and uh, one of the things that, that I, I, I got to interact with was Dremel. Okay. And so Dremel is now the, the, the query engine behind Big, uh, BigQuery. And, you know, it kind of had a lot of these sort of, sort of similar, uh, similar concepts under the hood, you know, separation and storage and compute, you know, all the data is out there in Colossus is stored in this okay. like, cluster file system. Um, that allowed you to to spin up and down these big, you know, sort of query, you know, sort of clusters, kind of on demand. Mm -hmm. Gave you this this idea of the separation of the read and write path. You know, you can like be writing in data, and this is a very steady workload. And you can like right okay. size and deployment yeah. for that, and you're just like jamming data into into you know object storage. And then whenever you have queries, you know, it tends to be very spiky and bursty, and so you kind of scale like kind of the compute up and down to satisfy. The demands of that and and it's it's something that that sort of it's it's only possible when you have like something that allows you to, to elastically scale your your infrastructure up and down and right. and if you know if if in contrast you know if you're relying on local disk storage or local memory to like yeah, stuff just gets insane well it's like you know hey you know i can't turn that server off because that's where the ebs volume is attached or that's where yeah. like, you know the in-memory store is and it sort of makes the mechanics of like spinning things up and down like super difficult mm -hmm. and so so time came around that we're starting to, to build observe starting to think about like hey you know we want something that like resembles that in our own solution um a snowflake was there you know like like they, they've actually built this 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 uh really uh, exquisite uh, data warehouse that sort of has mm -hmm. all of the properties that we were looking for, um, for an observability solution. And okay. we kind of had to, we made a, we made a, a deliberate decision. We would rather like focus our efforts on building like a great end to end solution, a great end to end product, a great observability, you know, product, um, rather than spend five years trying to build a database that could satisfy all of our needs. And it's sort of a, yeah, it's, no, it's a deliberate I mean, it, build versus buy, you know, trade-off we had to make. Yeah. Build versus buy, it makes yeah. sense. It's funny, yeah. I mean, I talked, I, I, I spoke at, at Snowflake's developer conference, and I actually did talk about observable as, as, as a, a, about observe mm -hmm. as an example of that. Partly from the perspective, of like, when you launch a company, um, you know, there, there can definitely be some later, movie, later mover advantage because, like, when you start, there is this there is this infrastructure potentially you can take advantage of in delivering that solution, and you know it it it, it, it we, we literally we charted it out like if you launched, I mean trying to do observability if your original architecture was built pre W pre AWS, 
that's going to create all kind. You will have made all sorts of architecturing architectural decisions that you might not otherwise have made. And and I think a post snowflake um, observability solution, in your case, observe it, it 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 shows some of that. Like, what are the things that we can take advantage of? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and, and and yeah, so it, it, that makes sense to me. And I, and I had one other kind of uh, I, thing here is like, you know, we're, we're talking about it's not just like observ observability is not just locked message and traces. It's the ability to like dive and navigate through this data and to mm -hmm. relate it all together. Um, so, so kind of, you know, one of the other kind of, uh, I guess, uh, non-obvious benefits of building this on top of a relational database is the ability to do joins. Like it is very easy for us, like, you know, in a SQL query, to, to correlate a log and a metric or, or to kind of, uh, you know, go from a trace to the logs on the, the container was running within and mm -hmm. to kind of just like, let's just like dive through that data, just, you know, just via very, very simple, you know, foreign key relationships in the data. And it's sort of something that's, that's sort of, it's, it's something that we can take advantage of being built on a relational database like that. That's much harder to do if you don't have that foundations of, of an analytics database. I think one of the other correlations I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, more of is, is like when you begin to look at, at some of the social data. So sometimes <laughs> it's not just like what happened with the system, but, but like what happened with the people that built the system and yeah. being able to, you know, pull in some of that information from Git, so GitLab or GitHub, and to really understand what was happening with the people, not just the, the infrastructure. I mean, you know, distributed systems are really hard. People are even harder yeah. and like being yeah. able to correlate like and identify, oh wait, okay, let us talk to this person and that may help us to solve that problem. I think uh, that's certainly, you know, for me at least, one of the interesting um, opportunities that you have. Yeah, and I think I think that actually speaks very much to like, like our philosophy about observability. Like it's not just, you know, much much tricks or whatever. It, it's, yeah, it's really the ability to, to follow these investigative journeys, wherever they take you, and having all that data at your fingertips. When, when actually one of the use cases we end up doing fairly frequently is, is uh, in addition to bringing in all the information from the environment, um, mm -hmm. yeah, bringing in uh, build events, you know, from CI/CD systems, you know, bringing in commit history, you know, source code management systems, and, and being able to correlate that to the infrastructure to sort of say like, oh, hey, you know, here's the build that's running right, like when we saw an error message. And this was the deployment that sort of like shipped that code. And then here are the commits yep. that were in that deployment and, and being able to sort of, I guess, trace that path um, just through the, through the data and, and, and observe. And it's sort of, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely like, it, it's, it's trying to scratch, you know, deeper beneath the surface than just the, the raw telemetry, but trying to figure out how to paint that story. Um, so okay. it's definitely yeah, that makes sense to me. how we approach it. Yeah. And on, on that note, I mean, I, I think there are, I mean, look, I'm not going to say there, there are two great stacks and that's all there is. And, <laughs> but at the moment, there are definitely two interesting centers of gravity. Uh -huh. So the kind of cloud native, Kubernetes, mm -hmm. all of the stuff that's going on there, you know, microservices, service mesh, lots of complexity, yeah. uh, containers, ephemerality, spinning them up, trying to understand what's happening. Y you know, it's a declarative infrastructure. There's, there's, there's a ton of events being generated. Um, I, you know, I've got lots of choices to make about where I run the containers. Um, I've got lots of questions about, you know, they might've been developed locally. So I've got that whole sort of container supply chain. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from Amazon, you've also got this like quite powerful, um, idea around, uh, Lambda functions mm -hmm. and serverless mm -hmm. where, um, you know, we're saying, actually, we're going to outsource more of it to the cloud. We don't feel that we need quite as much exposure um for portability sake as we we've got with like you know kubernetes um uh based infrastructures but 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 you know we we still need to bring stuff on, it, sort of under management and and look they come together uh, you know obviously you you've got um uh things like fargate i'm not saying they're completely separate but there are these two different worlds um or at least there are these two emerging sorts of stacks and they're gonna you know we're gonna see some of both of them functions and containers, like how do you see um, that build out continuing and what's the value of an observability solution in helping customers that want to manage and build applications and troubleshoot applications across both of those environments over the next few years? Yeah, yeah. 
All right, so oh my god, I've given you a massive philosophical question. No, no, no and you you could <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah, yeah. And I think so. There's a lot of there's a lot of different pieces. So let's let's kind of take one piece at a time. Let's talk about I guess um, serverless for a second, like lambdas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, totally different runtime. Um, and as it means, like kind of you know, if you if you had like a, a favored way to to monitor and troubleshoot your you know your system before. Uh, it, you don't have it anymore with serverless. It's all gone, right? There's Absolutely no, there's not. no host to like run your agent on, like you know, there's nothing to SSH into. Like it's just a totally different, different world. Um, and so I, I think you know everyone's having to try to retrench and figure out like what is the the right way to do this. Um, and and I I'm, I'm afraid to say like it it, it is kind of a, a gnarly problem, right? Like even if you try to instrument your application. Um, you know, that's running in, in, in Lambda, like that, that data needs to be exported, you mm -hmm. know, somehow. And to be uh, fair, Amazon, I think is doing a much better job of the instrumentation than they were. I oh, feel sure. like yeah. they've taken a step back and been like, let's standardize, let's publish more so that we can have ecosystem partners building solutions. So I think they, right. they've, they like, they understand that like at first it was all black boxing. I feel like they, they're doing yeah. a better job now. I wholeheartedly agree. And I, was, I think. What what I've seen is like kind of the easiest way to get telemetry out of out of server you know so far is really just to write it to standard out, and then it ends mm -hmm. up in CloudWatch, and then you can pluck it out of CloudWatch or you can you can build metrics. I mean, it's it's kind of it's it's a much much easier way um, to to kind of deal with things. And so yeah, so it's Amazon so sort of solved some of that problem for you, um, and and kind of getting back to this idea of like the maturation journey that that, that folks go through. Um, so now instead of like SSHing into the host. It's like where the website's running. Now, now all the engineers are logging into the Amazon console, and they're sort right. of like kind of starting their journey there. Um, and and it, it works. It works okay. Um, I think one of the things I've always kind of struggled with is as I pull up CloudWatch logs and I see like hundreds of thousands of log streams, and I'm like, ah, oh, which one was it? You know, like, and so it sometimes it can get a little bit difficult to 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 sift through that data with the UI that that that. Amazon provides and, and they're improving that with log insights and stuff like that, but there's still, there still feels like a gap there. And so, Oh yeah, no, there's definitely a gap. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so now, so yeah, so, so now, uh, you know, I guess what typically what I'm looking for these days is, is, you know, Hey, how can I get, like, how can I stream all this data out into a system where it's easier to slice and dice and it's easier to okay. do just sort of ad hoc analytics on. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to, to stream data out of CloudWatch logs um, with the CloudWatch metrics streams. You can just like jam all the CloudWatch metrics into Kinesis and get them out of, out of uh, Amazon that way. And so, so kind of given those two things, you know, you, you have to route all of the data through CloudWatch, but you can still get it out and you can still bring to bear, um, you know, products like ours or, or, or even Grafana, you know, to, to start to troubleshoot. And so, so I feel like, you kind of, I think we're, we're we're finding ways to kind of get mm -hmm. back to the same level of of uh, introspection and observability as we used to have, but it took a while to kind of like kind of get comfortable with the idea of routing everything through CloudWatch, um, and um, uh, so I mean so that's kind of like a little bit of the story that's going on with, with serverless, but then uh, in containerization and Kubernetes, and 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 that's that's actually very, very helpful for everyone, I, I have to say, is that now, you know, in order to, to, to instrument, you know, this, this big runtime, uh, it's just a matter of deploying a daemon set into the cluster, you know, like, like mm -hmm. just the, the operation, the, the, the configuration of it is so much simpler than having to deploy, you know, uh, you know, a host agent, you know, with your yeah, AMI yeah, yeah. or any of that kind of stuff. So that, 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 that part's uh -huh. well improved. Um, and so that that's a benefit for everyone. But then, um, one of the interesting things I, I think we're also starting to see with 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 containerization is, um, I think culturally, uh, everyone sort of shifted to to much more of like a metrics mindset than a log mindset when it comes to Kubernetes. You know, it's like yep, yeah, I would Q agree with that. So kubectl logs, like this is fabulous for like getting the logs of like some deployment. So like that's you know that that's sort of a satisfying initial solution and and really you know kind of your your. Your main challenge is, hey, I need to, to alert on the running system. And so, you know, first thing you do after setting up the Kubernetes deployment is you roll out the Prometheus operator and you start to set up, you know, sort of, uh, you know, scraping rules and, and alerting rules and, and sort of building a practice around that. And 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 I think that's that's uh, I think it's very good. I mean, it's sort of it's it's a great way for for people to it's great for people to have 
um, sort of a structured way of thinking about um, the the monitoring side. Um, but um, but but it's it's I guess it's not all it's not all roses there. <laughs> so we've seen all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I mean, I think I think one of the continuing this analogy of like the maturation journey, um, you know, everyone starts out with like, hey, one small test Kubernetes deployment, and they they're running Prometheus on it, and and all's well and good, but then. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Uh, hey, we decided we needed, uh, we need it. We need we need uh, we need a test. We need uh, we need uh, you know a staging cluster, or a prod cluster, and you know, and sort of you start to sort of bifurcate the environment a little bit, and you start to think about access controls for these different runtimes, and 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 so now it's like, okay, what do I do? Do I put like Prometheus on each one of those? Okay, cool. Uh, so now I need West Coast and East Coast. And I need Europe. Uh, so there's a few more Kubernetes deployments, and I, I need Prometheus on each of those. And, and, and we've seen wild um, spreadsheets of like, you know, here are the 10 different monitoring tools and the 18 yeah, different clusters we have them in. And I you just have hyperlinks to all these things. That one thing. Yeah, there's a lot of that going yeah, on. Yeah. And so now, yeah. So now you just want to ask a basic question. It's like, hey, I'm seeing an error in one place. Am I seeing that error in the other place? Or, we you know, like, what, what is a blast radius of an issue? And, and sort of it, like things start to, 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 I guess, stop satisfying the needs of like a, a let's say a high competency observability like when you've kind of only standardized on these tools that are running locally within that kubernetes cluster and you start sort of feeling that need to centralize this and to have like sort of a, a you know let's say a common store that you can ask questions across all of these things okay uh, and, and, and i think it's it, it's it's sort of it, it mimics a lot of the, the issues that you know because people had to resolve in the maturation journey you know, ten years ago. I mean, the same thing. Honestly, I, yeah. that's IT. We yeah, <laughs> exactly. Implement, rinse, repeat. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you know, yeah. No, we, we definitely get that. We we solve a yeah. problem and then we we build a new stack and we have to resolve the problem. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna ask you like a final question then. Sure. So you're in this place where you know you're you're uh, I guess. So what's the, if there's like one big challenge for the next year or like what's next for Observe, mm. um, that, that feels like a great place to like book in the conversation. You know, here we are, like what's the next big challenge that you need to solve in order to offer more value to your customers in terms of the journeys we've spoken about today and the infrastructures that they need to manage? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, I think... Uh... A lot of times when we approach customers, um, they're, they're not just looking for a generic platform um, for, you know, like, hey, something that can just like take all the data and, the, and, 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 you know, kind of spit it back at you and sort of make you do all the work to actually troubleshoot. Um, you know, more often than not, you know, people are, are sort of somewhere in this maturation journey and, and, they're, and they're looking for a little bit of, of guidance about how to structure sort of their telemetry, how to structure their practice. They're looking for a little bit of opinion about like, hey, what's what's sort of the the, the right way to go about monitoring systems? Okay. Um, and um, and for what's worth, like I, I feel like New Relic kind of nailed this ten years ago with Ruby on Rails applications. It's like you're running this Rails application, you know, you have like you have the web server, you have like a database server, and you have transactions, and like you know, Rails, or uh, New yep. Relic had a uh, just a great you know dashboard for like tying that whole story together and it was very opinionated about here are the things you need to pay attention to um i, I think one of the, the big challenges and, and one of the big you know, opportunities for us is to is to figure out like what does that opinion look like in this new world where oh, we're, we're not really running rails applications stacks. it's like more complicated stuff there's lots of ephemeral architectures like it's just it's just very very complicated but there are still use cases hidden kind of within that that mess and so mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, for instance, we're spending time kind of putting together, uh, you know, essentially packaged content that sort of says like, hey, you know, uh, yeah, you, you are running Lambdas in AWS. You know, here's sort of the, the way that all the data should be structured. Here are the alerts that you should have out of the box. Here's the dashboards mm -hmm. you need to be looking at. And they just kind of provide a, a, a starting point for people to, to think about how to monitor. Oh, systems. my colleague Kelly is going to yeah. love this. She is yeah. all about technical communication in all its sort of richness and thinking about like the opinion, but like that, I mean, effectively that is a, yeah, helping customer uh, customers understand what they need to do um, at any given time. Yeah, no, that that's, 
So uh, a good solid opinion from the uh, from Observe. That's what comes next. Um, been a great conversation. Uh, yep, I'm James Governor from Red Monk. Um, uh, I'm here with Jacob Leverich from Reserve, and this has been a conversation with Red Monk. And I've really enjoyed it. Learned a lot about observability today. Uh, thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. All right, DZone would like to thank Jacob and James for a great presentation. DZone would also like to thank Observe for providing the audience with a fantastic webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who tuned in today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career.